My name is George Isaac. I'm with the Delta Science Program. Good morning. I want to quickly just briefly outline what happened and where we're going with this. Uh, following the, uh, the summit, uh, we assembled a team of writers uh, comprising of uh, folks from uh, agencies, NGOs, and even the private industry. Uh, these folks will now go back and start their writing assignments, and we hope that they will come out with a white paper uh, by the end of uh, July. And the draft, which will then will be, we will select a, a peer review panel, which will review the draft. And we are hoping by the end of uh, September or mid-September, we'll have a, uh, a white paper that will serve as a roadmap uh, on how we can start moving towards this new era of uh, data management and discovery knowledge. Thank you. Okay. And George, of course, th that draft will be totally open. We've been encouraging people uh, you to, to comment on the draft, so there'll be a, an extensive opportunity for you, your folks who were at the workshop or who were not to uh, you know, comment on the draft as well. Right. And all of the all of the talks are on our website. They've been archived, and it uh, was quite an entertaining and educative uh, uh, line of speakers that we had. Quite a valuable day that we spent. So I would encourage everyone to take a second look at that. And more than 1,300 people participated live you know, beyond the people who were there. So you know, I think what we heard from the science community in the development of the science plan, they were right. There was a lot of interest in this. But are there any qu questions on big data? Questions on big data. Susan? Um, the, I read your report. It's, it's, it's a very good summary. I I think I understood most of it. I have only one question, and that is uh, uh, on your some of your outcomes. What is a reflective, a reflexive change control mechanisms? <laughs> Did I write that? <laughs> And I don't need an answer right now. If, if uh, maybe we could have a side conversation, I'm just looking to be educated. I believe it's it, it's something to do with with uh, something like an adaptive management, looking at it and uh, you know uh, reacting to what 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 comes in in terms of data. And ensuring, yeah. It's showing the flexibility, I think, for the for the future. But yeah, all will be revealed shortly. We'd be happy to get back to you on that. More to come, Phil. Uh, scientists uh, in America have fallen in love with the uh, uh, phrase "big data," "big data," uh, possibly as a shorthand for endless amounts of new money coming in to accumulate information. But at the same time, in the public arena. The fear of privacy invasion through the use of what is also being called big data is increasingly common. How do you avoid being polluted in what you're seeking to do by using a phrase that is associated with privacy invasion and the collection of an anonymous amount of vast data that affects individuals? That's a great question. Do you want to go first, George? I'll yeah, I think the term big data has been so loosely used today, but, but the technology behind big data has many facets to it that actually addresses such problems as security. And, and those have become very important factors. And the banks use it today. Uh, Amazon and Google use big data today. And they have been very successful at it. And their outcomes have been phenomenal. So they have measures to take care of uh, er areas of security. Uh, we just have to be more educated uh, in understanding. The Would you like to comment on the uh, uh, the uh, ongoing congressional investigations of the National Security Agency <laughs> and the collection of big data in that? I mean, look, the point the point I'm just trying to make is a phrase is useful because it is a shorthand for understanding. But this is a collection of scientists who are in love with this whole process and seemingly 
not reflecting about how the use of that phrase in a popular vernacular offers challenges and threats to what you're trying to do. Uh, I just suggest it's something you're going to have to consider. Witness the 30 years of battling that's been going on on whether it's global warming, climate change, or something, or just weather, uh, and the difficulty science has had dealing with that. It, it is certainly a topic that will be addressed in the white paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I went to one day of the data summit, and one of the presenters on his slide had definition of big data, a buzzword that's so overused it's meaningless and distinguishes nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but will be constantly so At least used. there was recognition. Yeah, right. yeah. Perhaps we could run that through the reflective, uh, reflexive change control mechanism. <laughs> All right, anything else on big data? Uh, okay. I uh, couldn't help smiling. I, I think perhaps Vice Chair uh, Eisenberg is just warming up as he's t addressing the Extreme Science uh, Conference for the National Science Foundation in a couple of months. Uh, Whose agenda contains not one discussion over four days, as best I understand it, on the possible misapplication of the phrase to the funding streams that you're all interested in. But that's just, yes, I am warming up. Yeah. <laughs> but, but actually, I, you know, I do think that's a, you know, a good point. And one of the dangers is when you, you're involved in these really big national initiatives, it doesn't matter if it's uh, related to climate change and things like that, just the importance of how that message is crafted and communicated. It, it's a, absolutely essential. So. That was, thanks, George, and again, thanks for the great job that you and all your colleagues did with the planning uh, committee. Uh, moving into science communication, now the Bay Delta Science Conference, the date for abstracts uh, has now passed. It closed on June the 11th. From what I understand, there was many, many more abstracts received than can possibly be uh, absorbed into the conference agenda, which is uh, it always a positive sign. So the conference organizing committee, the program, again, have a tough job whittling that down and making uh, a cohesive program out of it. We're expecting to see that uh, pr probably in August, um, what they come up with. The... Next item, if there was no comments about the conference, again, I'd certainly urge you to make sure it's on your calendar. Uh, any uh, time that you have during that week, please feel free just to, to drop in and uh, just see the depth of the discussion you, uh, with the science community. We'd certainly appreciate to see you there. We also th thought we'd make just a few comments on El Nino. You may be reading this in the in the papers, and uh, I thought uh, I would just give you a very brief overview of what's going on. It, it's, from the scientific point of view, there's so many really cool processes, you know, Kelvin waves and things like that. It's really a fascinating natural phenomenon. Um, but I'll just give you a very brief overview now. If this is a topic that is of interest to you, then maybe the next meeting I'll come back and we can you, you look at a few videos that Noah put out, and uh, we'll just keep you updated. But El Nino sort of means the, the, the boy child, of course. And what you'll see where it refers to climate and particularly its relationship to us here in California is that often when we see these, this El Nino condition, it implies, although there's now some controversy about this, but it implies it's going to be a, a wetter period. So the reason that there's so much attention is focused on the El Nino phenomenon is that if we move into an El Nino, the chances of the drought being broken goes up quite dramatically. And so what El Nino is, it's a, a measurement of the ocean surface temp temperatures. And many years ago, before this really became, as uh, Vice Chair Eisenberg says, a buzzword that is pushed around a lot, it was used... Um, in Ecuador and coastal Peru by the, actually initially the local fishermen there. And what they noticed is that typically just before Christmas, 
the ocean temperature would warm up by several degrees. And that became the trigger where the fish would no longer be so available. That was the trigger where they would beach their boats, mend their nets. Uh, it was usually about Christmas time, which is how it got the, the term El Nino. Um, and then they also noticed that that would happen pretty much every year, but every two to seven years, you would get a much greater warming. You, you have three degrees Celsius or, or more, very significant increase in the, in the ocean. And people began to notice that that warmer temperatures often coincided with much wetter you know, winters in that part of the world. And from there, the analysis extended to see that under the El Nino conditions, um, that also started correlating with what Mike Dettinger had termed uh, atmospheric rivers. So we started seeing much wetter periods here in the northern hemisphere, particular, well, not northern hemisphere, in California. When that happens in California, with the air patterns in Idaho, Washington, we tend to see uh, to go into warmer and drier periods. Why there was so much excitement and attention related to this in California that January, February through early March, it looked like that these warmer temperatures setting up looked to be as extreme as they were back in 1998, the last really uh, big wet year, sorry, 1997. Unfortunately, that's dissipated uh, and is still continuing to dissipate. But they're still predicting that there's a 70% chance of El Nino happening, and I'll explain what that definition is now uh, this summer, but an 80% chance of El Nino occurring in the fall to winter. So El Nino is defined as five consecutive months where the sea temperature in that part of the world where it's monitored uh, as an indicator is uh, more than half a degree Celsius above the long-term average. And so the first thing to note is these temperature shifts are very small, and yet that small change in temperature because of the amount of heat and energy that's uh, absorbed in the, in the ocean can really drive big changes in, in the atmosphere. So uh, we're still hopeful that, that there will be an El Nino setup that's likely to uh, hopefully result in a, a wetter year. And so if you have an interest, maybe we'll just keep tracking this to see the, the build-up if, uh, if it's something you'd like just to be part of the lead scientist report until we know one way if this is going to happen or not. Yes. Okay. The other point that I would also make is that often you hear associated with climate change, well, 0.1 degrees Celsius, 0.2 degrees Celsius. <coughs> Some of these El Nino events, you know, we're seeing two degrees, maybe even in very extreme cases, four degrees Celsius difference in the really big events where we see these massive changes in precipitation patterns. So this is the short-term variability that lasts typically in an El Nino lasts nine to ten months. The opposite, the La Nina, where you go into dry, lasts typically about three years. But it just shows how sensitive the, the globe is to these very small changes in temperature and just what a significant impact uh, it, it can have. So, so if this is of interest to you, maybe we'll next time spend a little more time, show you some of the animations. It's really tremendous uh, satellite technology, and then we'll just give you brief updates, uh, perhaps as a precursor of what we might expect in the fall. Okay, if there are no questions on that, I'll go to the last item. And Sam, jump in if there's anything I missed there. The only thing I would add on, on the El Nino is it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, it's good when you get more rain, but it, it can be bad too. 97, 98 was a, was a flood year, so um, we, we, want, we want the good El Nino, the one that gives us just the right amount of rain, but not too much. <laughs> Sam, the uh, flood control capacity in the reservoirs in California should be adequate to uh, uh, absorb a 96-97 event. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, great. So the last item here is by the numbers, and you Mei Ling couldn't be here today. She's actually at the camp uh, planning meeting, as she's also working on the fish and flows with the uh, your ISB. So... She couldn't be here today, but we have a very 
Um, great substitution, uh, Jenny Bigelow, of course you've met before, she's our other state fellow doing a wonderful job on many things. And uh, so Jenny was going to walk us through by the numbers and as she's added a few slightly different things, we thought, particularly on the fish side, we better have Sam here to ask the, answer the really tough questions. So Jenny, thanks for being Thank here. You.